Celebration Church DC, what is up? Happy Sunday. No, you have not been hacked. My name is Nate and I serve with our Celebration family here in Orlando. If this is your first time tuning in to Church at Home with Celebration DC, we wanna welcome you. We also wanna connect with you, so make sure that you connect with us online or via the brand new Celebration Church DC app found on the Google Play Store or the App Store. Before we go into a time of worship, we just wanna let you know that the chat is live and ready to go. So let us know where you're tuning in from, if there's anything that we can do for you or anything that we can pray with you about. But let's go into a time of worship right now. When night has fallen, when fear is coming, still you're calling me. When faith is lost and my hope exhausted, you will be my strength. When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me, yeah. I've decided I'm not giving up. Cause you won't give up on me. You won't give up on me. Your love is holding on and it won't let go. I feel it breaking out like an echo. Your love is holding on and it won't let go. I feel it breaking out like an echo, echo in my soul. So in every season, you keep repeating promises to me. Now there's no stopping what you have started. Until it is complete When my mind says I'm not good enough God, you're enough for me Yeah, I've decided I'm not giving up Cause you won't give up on me You won't give up on me Your love is holding on and it won't let go
I've decided I'm not giving up Cause you won't give up on me You won't give up on me Your love is holding on and it won't let go I feel it breaking out like an echo Your love is holding on and it won't let go
Hey church, we are going to transition into another time of worship and that's through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. And here at Celebration Church, we believe that we pursue God in every aspect of our life and that includes our finances. And uh, generosity is is so, such a great part of this church. And we actually had a testimony recently of a family who's been struggling through the pandemic and uh, both of the parents lost their jobs. They were having a hard time putting food on the table for their kids, but through your generosity, we've been able to provide food for that family family and also some practical needs as well. So we just want to thank you for continuing to put God first. You can continue to do that online or through the app. Another way that you can worship God is worship God, worshiping God with your time uh, and with your talents. And we do that here at Celebration Church through serving. Even in a pandemic, there are ways that we can serve our community. So make sure you go onto the website to learn more about how you can get connected to a serving team here at Celebration Church. Well, we're about to hear an incredible message from Pastor Keith. So tune in, grab a pen, grab some paper, take some notes, and let's hear what God has for us today. Welcome to Celebration Church. We are so, so glad that you're with us today. If there's anything we can do for you or your family, as we say, please don't hesitate to let us know. It is our honor to come alongside and serve our family and our community in any way humanly possible. I pray that you guys are excited and stirred up for, for today's message because I know that I am. I want you to go ahead and, and grab your Bibles, get your, get your notepad, whatever your device is to take notes. I want to tell you, one of the most transformational things in my walk with God has been going back and looking at the, the notes of sermons and different moments with God and reflecting on seeing what God was speaking to me then and how it was so relevant to me now. So please be a person that, that take notes, that processes and internalize what we believe God is speaking because I do believe that God has a word for you today. Now, we're kicking off a brand new series called Pursue. And I'm truly believing that this is going to be an incredibly powerful series for all of us. Here's what pursue means. Pursue simply means to seek, to attain, to accomplish. Some of the synonyms mean like to chase down. That's a strong, that's a strong verb type tense where it's saying we're going to chase it down. We're going to fully engage. We're going to seek after it. It's really at the heart of who we are as a church. We believe that, that we have an opportunity, a responsibility to pursue the things that God has for us. If you've been a part of our community for any period of time, you may have heard us share our mission statement of saying that we're leading people to experience a God first life. And at the core of it, we still really believe that, but we've made a subtle shift. And that shift is we don't believe that we're called to simply passively wait to experience God, but we believe that God has called us to passionately pursue everything that we want to experience. And so what we call ourselves now in a sense of what our mission statement is, we can know that we're called to be God's family pursuing God's kingdom. Same principle, but it changes the tense a little bit where God is calling us to pursue everything that he has for us. Because I want you to write this down. I believe this in my heart and you're going to hear this throughout the course of this series. Our pursuit determines our experience. See, when we pursue things, that actually determines what our experience is going to be. Experiences don't just show up, but we have to pursue what we want to experience. Matthew 6.33, it's our foundational scripture here at Celebration Church. It says this, it says, but seek first the kingdom of God. That word seek, again, that's a synonym of pursue. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided unto you. This is Jesus giving his disciples a teaching on the importance of pursuing the things 
things of God and then maybe the things that are on your mind, the burdens on your heart, those things will be added to you. You're going to get provided for. You're going to get the blessings you've been looking for. But you have to pursue the things of God first. Our pursuit determines what we experience. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 7, it says this. It said, ask and you will find. I'm sorry, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and a door will be opened to you. You see this, you see this if then proposition, so to speak. It's a, it's a cause and effect where it says if you ask, then it will be given. If you seek, then you will find it. If you knock, then it will be open. Those things don't just happen without the front part that is required upon us, the seeking, the pursuing. If I ask, then I will receive it. If I seek, if I pursue, then I will find it. Our pursuit determines our experience. And even when it comes to the context of things inside of the kingdom, we're supposed to pursue it. It doesn't just happen. First Timothy chapter six, verse number 11, it says, it says, but you man of God flee from these things. Again, Timothy, Paul is telling Timothy to flee from sin and, and, and other things that are more worldly and carnal. He said, flee from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. What, what Paul is telling Timothy is that righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness, it is within your grasp, but you have to pursue it. It's not going to just show up. It's going to be something that you're going to have to pursue. Our pursuit determines our experience. God is calling us to go after it. It's not just going to happen. I, I remember living in varying cities and, and people asking me, what's it like to live in that city? I remember when I moved to D.C. What's it like to live in D.C.? And initially, I remember for the first couple of months, you guys may remember when I broke my ankle, I was I lost a lot of mobility. So I didn't get a chance to experience what it felt like to really live in D.C. I was living there, but I wasn't really having the experience of being there. But it wasn't until I regained my mobility that I get a chance to to go out and, and visit some of the restaurants, to engage some of the, the museums, to begin to take in the sites and understand the history. Then I was able to answer the question. Now I know what it's like to experience living in this area because I had to actually get up and pursue it. See, our pursuit determines our experience and what we see here in scripture. Scripture even says that when we pursue the things of God, that there's a reward that comes on the back end of that. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number six, it says this, it says, now faith, now without faith, it is impossible to please God since he who draws near to him must believe that God exists and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. See that phrase, that God rewards you if you seek him, but we have to do our part. We have to draw near to him. That is what God is compelling us to do, that there's a lot of things that are available to us, that, that wholeness is available to us, that healing is available to us, that freedom is available to us, and we don't have to work for it. We have to pursue the person that provides it. That is what this series is really going to be all about. That is what we're going to be talking about over the next couple of weeks. And as you can see, I am so elated about it. But our primary passage that we're going to spend some time in today is found in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 2. We're going to look at 12 verses really quick. We're going to pray and we're going to unpack a few things that I really think can be really transformational for you and your family and your journey as it relates to pursuing what God has for you. Starting here at verse number 1, it says this, And when he entered Capernaum again after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many people gathered together and there was no more room, not even in the doorway, as he was speaking the word to them. Then they came and bringing a paralytic carried by all four of them. Since there was not able to bring him into Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after digging through it, they lowered the mat on which the paralytic was laying. Seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in our hearts. Why does he speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Right away, Jesus perceived in his spirit what they were thinking and what they were thinking to themselves. And he said, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Jesus was picking up what they were putting down and he wanted to address it right there on the spot. And so he says to them in verse number nine, which is easier to say to the paralytic that your sins are forgiven or to say to get up, take up your mat and walk but so that you may know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then turns back to the paralytic and he says, I tell you to get up, take up your mat and go home. Immediately he got up and took up the mat and he went out in front of everyone. As a result, they were all astounded and gave glory to God saying, 
we have never seen anything like this. We've never seen anything like it. Today, I want to talk to us uh, about this idea of pursuing God and the part that we can play in helping others to pursue God and to move forward in their lives. If you're taking notes, which we've already established, you absolutely are. I want you to write this message title down. Do your hands have splinters? Let's pray and see where God's going to take us today. God, we're so thankful. We're so thankful for opportunities for us to gather in your presence. And as we define what it means to pursue you, it means to intentionally gather. It means to get after it. It means to posture ourselves in an effort to get everything you have for us. Our community, we're gathered. We're pursuing you. So Lord, your word declares that there is a reward, that there's a blessing and that blessing is your presence. So Father, I just pray for the next few moments that you speak to us. Give us open eyes to see you, open ears to hear you and open hearts to receive everything that you have for us today. It's in Jesus name that we pray. Amen. You know, if you've ever been in a place where you've really wondered, what is my purpose? Like, what, what am I called to do? Like, why, why am I here? What, what does that look like for me? I, I remember pondering those questions at different seasons of my life. And, and, and I remember just about 15 years ago when I was really trying to think that through. See, it was 15 years ago, approximately, when I when I moved from from Delaware, right outside of the Philadelphia area, and found myself living in Jacksonville, Florida. See, at my my church that I was a part of in Delaware, my wife and I, we were incredibly involved. We were very, very deeply connected. We were we were preaching. We were leading youth. It was something that that given us a, a sense of purpose. But now we were moving, and I was following a job opportunity down to Jacksonville, Florida, where I knew no one. And I remember wrestling with this idea: is man, is my calling done? Is, is my calling exclusively geographically based or, or is it going to travel with me here? And if it is, then, then how is it going to work? Because I don't know anybody. As I was working for the school district, I remember a friend of mine inviting me to come to Celebration Church and, and, and I didn't know what to expect. I never realized how stepping into the, the doors of an unknown church can seem very overwhelming, even for a person of faith. And, 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 and it was something that I just didn't know what to anticipate or what to expect. My family and I, we show up in a parking lot and we're greeted by parking lot attendants and they're smiling and filled with joy. We, we walk in through the front doors and someone greets us and smiles and said that they're glad that we're there. It was really surprising. And, and as we found ourselves walking into, someone greeted us at the door and led us to a seat that was going to accommodate my family and I. The entire experience was, was one that was really powerful, was one that we, that we deeply enjoyed. As we began to get settled in and get connected to what it was, the message that was being spoken there, I I turned to Megan. I said, I think we can make this our church home. And that's what we did for the next month, uh, next six months, rather. We found ourselves coming to church, enjoying the experience, going home and just being filled with so much peace. But then there was this moment where our our global senior pastor, Pastor Stovall, he began to preach this message about the importance of participating, the importance of engaging in what God was doing. At the time, because I was still wrestling with with my calling and, 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 and transitioning from the church we were a part of, I, I remember reluctantly saying, like, God, like, I don't I don't think that this I have anything to offer this church. It's such a it's such a massive church. They they have tons of people that are already involved. My, my little bit of contribution won't make a difference whatsoever. But I really remember God saying, you're right, Keith, I. I don't need you to serve. I don't need you to give. I I don't need you to get involved in groups, but I do require your obedience. And would you be willing to be obedient to what I'm telling you to do? It's time for you to get engaged and participate. I have a little bit of a stubborn streak. So sometimes whenever God's telling me to do something that I want to do, I hear him clearly. But when he's telling me something I don't want to do, I need to confirm it. God, I need you to give me a sign. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. And so I said that. I said, Lord, I just I just don't know. If you really want me to get involved, I just need you to make it clear as if the message that was being preached wasn't clear enough. Some things you just don't got to pray about. But nonetheless, I said, God, I just need you to make it more clear. Literally the following week, I'm sitting in the back row of the church and the gentleman is walking by and he does a double take and he comes up and he walks up to me. He's like, hey, I feel like God wants me to tell you that you've been on the sidelines long enough. It's time for you to get back involved. He didn't know who I was. I didn't know who he was, but somehow God stirred his heart and it was the word that I needed to hear. From that point forward, I knew that God was calling me to get back involved in the community that I was now a part of. I started serving on the usher team and it was really transformational for me. For I remember for my family and I, like us being connected, Megan and Denier are serving in, in kids ministry. Keith Jr. is serving in the parking lot and I'm serving on the usher team. All of us were involved and we absolutely loved it. I got connected to a group of men, I call them our brotherhood, many of which I'm still friends with these guys even to this day. It was transformational for me. 
we ended up going to an outreach all together. And while I was there, I got connected with another minister at our church. He served as the next gen pastor and we struck up a really profound, close friendship. And it was amazing what, what God did through that. I started serving with youth and, and doing outreaches and connecting with people in the community. And it was something that I was finding myself being filled with so much joy and, and love for. Then I got connected to another guy and he asked me to start helping him serve in men's ministry. So I'm serving in men's ministry now and I'm, I'm helping to connect with other guys and helping people get connected to the life of the church. I was loving every moment of it. I couldn't, I couldn't stop thinking about it. It was almost all I wanted to do. I, I didn't know what God was going to do with it, but I felt like I was on this trajectory to make a difference and I was willing to do that for free. Then I was invited to, to join our church staff. I, I have a background in a completely different field, but I was invited to join our church staff and our groups where I was hired as the group's pastor. And, and I had to prepare myself to, to pursue and to step into what God was inviting me to be a part of because I knew. I knew that it was going to require a little bit of a sacrifice. I knew that stepping into this role was, was going to require me to take a substantial pay cut. But it was a moment then that God made it clear to me, like, if you're willing to sacrifice to pursue what I'm calling you to do, I will take care of everything else. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things, because I found myself saying, Lord, I want to follow you, but I got, I got some bills. You see the way my monthly budget is set up, Lord. I, I don't know how it's all going to work, but God said, but can you put me first and allow me to work these things out? And I've, I'm proof positive of seeing that take place. As I continue to serve in our group's ministry, then I got connected to our next gen ministry. Then I got put in a position where I'm serving as the executive pastor and now, and now a lead pastor. I, I say a lot to say this. I, I am walking in the fulfillment of what I know God has called me to do, but, but I often think back to how did I get here? It all started with someone telling me, hey man, it's time for you to get off the sidelines. It's time for you to, to get back involved in me simply saying yes and showing up and pursuing it. When I was invited to be a part of a group, I pursued it. When I was invited to go and do an outreach, I pursued it. When I was invited to, to get in con connected to Next Gen Ministry, I pursued it. When I was invited to join our, our group's ministry, I pursued it. Everything that was laid out in front of me, when I knew that it was God that was inviting me to do it, I pursued it. And somehow me saying yes and pursuing the doors that God was presenting in front of me, it led me to me walking into the fulfillment of what I ultimately feel like I'm called to do. You see, I recognize that, that our experiences just don't show up, that our calling doesn't just show up, but there's something that's required upon us and or for us to really begin to walk in what God is calling us to do and to have that sense of peace and knowing that you're doing what God has called you to do. What I sense is that many in our community are wondering to themselves the same way that I was about 15 years ago, what is my, what is my purpose? What, what is my calling? What, what is this all about? As, as I drive through our communities and I see businesses that have had to close, I find myself wrestling with, man, I wonder how those business owners are doing when I see people whose careers have had to shift as a result of, of what this season has looked like for them. I often find myself wondering, I wonder, I wonder how they're doing. And I suspect that there's many in our community that are pondering through those exact same thoughts. What does it all look like? And, and I want to help us today. I truly believe that our ultimate purpose is that knowing that we are created in the image of God and that we are called to reflect his image in whatever place he has planted us. That is what our calling is. That is what our purpose is. And for some of us, that could be in full-time vocational ministry to reflect the image of God to the community that we're a part of. For, for others of us, it could mean that we're attorneys and God is calling us to reflect the image of God in the environments that he's called us to be in. For others, it may be to be a single mom and that God is calling us in this season to continue to reflect the image of God even in challenging situations. Single dads, even if you're a stay-at-home mom, stay-at-home dad, to reflect the image of God wherever God has placed you and call it, but it's not just reflecting the image of God, but it's doing it with a servant's heart. I truly believe that serving can serve as a gateway that unlocks our purpose and fulfillment. When I can, when I can approach my marriage with a servant's heart, when I can approach my family with a servant's heart and reflecting the image of God, it can lead to transformation that has the ability to impact people and to move them forward. You see, Jesus, he saw a connection between serving and his purpose. See, in Matthew chapter 20, verse number 28, Jesus says this. He said, just as the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus directly connected his purpose in life with serving. I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve. And with that serving is to give of my life. Jesus was showing us a connection that when I serve, that is how I'm fulfilling my purpose. See, when we look at the life of Jesus, when he taught, he was serving. When he healed people, he was serving. 
I believe that serving can serve as a gateway in helping us to truly walk in our purpose. Our purpose isn't just delivered. It's something that we have to pursue. And I think we have the ability to pursue it through serving. It's amazing the doors that it can open and the fulfillment that we may have when we choose to serve others and to put others first. That's why here at our church, we believe that we are others focused. We're called to be participators. We're called to do our part with pursuing everything that God has for us. When we look at this passage of scripture here in Mark chapter number two, we see a lot of pursuit that's taking place. Let me give us some background really quick. See, this entire miracle takes place in a town called Capernaum. This turns, this turns out to be like Jesus' home base. It's, it's where his, it's like his base of operation. And, and what scripture tells us is that was not the first time that Jesus has spent any time in Capernaum. In fact, there's another passage earlier in the text that talks about when Jesus was in Capernaum and that he healed Peter's mother-in-law. But I love the sequence of events. It says that Peter's mother-in-law was sick with a fever. And what happens is they bring Jesus into the situation and he takes her by the hand and he raises her up and this, the sickness goes away and as she gets up and she serves them. See, before they put her sickness into the hands of Jesus, she was laid down and unable to serve. But the moment that they took her sickness and put it into the hands of Jesus, she was raised up and able to move forward. What I want us to see here is that there's power when we put things into the hands of Jesus. It unlocks our ability to begin to move forward. And I often say to myself, I say it to my family, I say it to our community, as long as it's in God's hands, it's not in mine. I believe that there's power when we could put it into the hands of Jesus and they put the sickness into the hands of Jesus. I believe that if we could put our marriages into the hands of Jesus, if we could put our resources into the hands of Jesus. You'd be amazed at what can happen when we simply put it into the hands of Jesus. And that is exactly what sparked a revival in Capernaum. So understandably so, when Jesus comes back into town, there's a lot of excitement. The text says that there are so many people there that they wanted to hear what Jesus was going to say. They wanted to see what he was going to do. But I also believe that in this narrative, there's a, there's a subtle hint of what a servant's heart does, what it looks like, and how it can impact somebody else. I want you to write down these three thoughts. These are gonna serve as our points, our barriers for today. Here's the first thing that I want us to recognize that I believe God is showing us in this text. Here's the first thing. Serving pursues people. That when we're serving, it should look like us pursuing people. Let me explain that for a moment. The text says that there was a paralyzed man in the community. Obviously paralyzed means that he's not able to move forward, that he's in a place where he's so dependent on others in order for him to function. But this paralyzed man had a community of people that understood that Jesus is in town. And if I can just get my friend into the presence of Jesus, then maybe his situation can change altogether. They approached their friend with a servant's heart. It required them to, to bend down to pick him up and to literally carry him into the presence of Jesus. It wasn't enough for them to just let their friend know about this man named Jesus and hopefully Jesus will pass by his home. It wasn't enough for them to, to simply say to Jesus, hey, I have a sick friend, maybe you can heal him but they took it upon themselves to pursue their friend and to bring him to where Jesus was. You see, when we're serving others, it's the, it looks like us pursuing people to put them into the presence of God. Serving pursues people. I often think about that gentleman, Steve, who saw me sitting on the back row of our church. He could have been very content with, man, one day he'll get involved. One day, um, it'll be great if he gets connected. But he saw me. God spoke to him and he came back and he pursued me. He actually went and he asked me, he invited me to be a part. Who are the people that are, that are in your world that God has put on your heart that he's asking you to pursue them? Who are the people in your world that God is asking you to serve them? When you have a servant's heart, it looks like you pursuing, not waiting for them to experience it, not just waiting for it to happen, but recognizing that I have to pursue it because my pursuit determines the experience. Serving pursues people. Here's the second thing that I want you to write down. Serving also means serving removes obstacles. What serving does is it removes obstacles. The text tells us that as the men are bringing their paralyzed man into the presence of Jesus, that they have some obstacles to deal with. It says that there was such a large crowd there that they could not even get to the doorway. They couldn't get in. It says the crowd obstructed them from moving forward. Now, here's the thing. When you actually dig down into the text a little bit more, you know who the crowd was? The religious people, the scribes, the Pharisees. They were the ones who were crowding the place so that the sick man couldn't get in. Think about that for a moment. Religion keeping people from experiencing Jesus. Man, I'll, I'll preach this thing if you let me. Religion being a barrier from keeping the sick people from coming in and experiencing Jesus. 
You know what I realized is that religion is man's way to God, but Jesus is God's way to man. And sometimes religion gets in the way and makes that incredibly difficult. They make it so difficult. Like sometimes the obstacle to go to church is maybe I don't have the right dress code, so I'm not going to go. Sometimes I'm feeling like I may be judged because of my mistakes, so I'm not going to go. Imagine the household of faith not being able to produce what it's supposed to do because religion is keeping people from feeling as if they can show up. But what these men recognize is that even though their religion may be here, our responsibility is to remove the obstacles. You know, when people show up at our doors and someone greets them, that is our way of removing the obstacles of them feeling like they're going to be judged and that they don't fit in. When we when we show someone where to park, that's our way of saying that we're removing the obstacles that are keeping people from feeling like they're welcome. That is the part that we play in our community when we recognize in the church that we're serving people and we're trying our best to remove the obstacles and letting them know that they're welcome. The men see the barriers there, but they're not content with leaving it in that situation. The scripture says that they actually go onto the roof. This is this is being creative. This is using a little bit of ingenuity and they begin to dig through the roof. That's that's a lot of faith. That takes a lot of boldness. They're tearing through the roof because they recognize that they are not going to be stopped with keeping someone who is inflicted, someone who needs to be in the presence of Jesus from getting their breakthrough. You see, when we go out of our way to present people into the presence of God, that is what it looks like when we're removing the obstacle. What I truly believe what serving does is it helps us to remove the obstacles that are keeping people from having these profound experiences with God. Sometimes religion stands in the way. Some some other challenges are in the way. But when we're part of a community that recognize that we are called to pursue people, but to remove the obstacles, allowing them to know that they are loved, allowing them to know that they're welcome and removing the barriers and presenting them in a place where they can listen to Jesus and allow Jesus and them to have a conversation and him do the work. I want us to hear me right now. So often religion tries to do the work of God for God. We want to speak condemnation. We want to speak guilt. We want to speak ridicule. It's not our job to do that. It's our job to position people in a place where they can have an encounter with Jesus and allow the Holy Spirit to do the work in their lives. When we serve, our responsibility is to remove the obstacles so that Jesus can speak to the challenges. Here's the, here's the third and, and final thought that I want to share with us, that, that when we serve people, it helps them to move forward, that serving moves people forward. See, what happens is that Jesus, he looks at the men and the scripture says when he sees their faith, not the faith of the paralyzed man, not, not the faith of the scribes and the Pharisees, but the faith of the people who were serving. When he seen their faith, it compelled him to act on behalf of the man who was paralyzed. Let's think about this for a moment. This man was paralyzed. He was unable to move forward in his own strength. There are many people that are part of our communities, people that are connected to our worlds, and they are paralyzed. They just can't seem to move forward. And we have an opportunity. We have a responsibility to play with doing our best to pursue them, to remove the obstacles, but to put them in a place so they can begin to move forward. I, I remember being in a place where when our finances were just in a tight spot, we're doing our best to figure it out. But someone said, like, have you ever considered going to Financial Peace University? I'll pay for your kit because I think this could be the thing that could be a breakthrough for you. For years, Megan and I have tried all types of solutions, but when we got connected to a community of people and someone removed the obstacles and we were able to listen to the content, we were able to make some decisions that helped us to move forward with our lives. See, when we're serving others, it helps people who are paralyzed, who may be stuck in a situation that they can't get out of in their own strength, it helps them to move forward because someone else's faith knows that this is exactly what you need. Jesus sees their faith and he's compelled to act and he looks at them and says, your sins are forgiven. In the case of this man, he was paralyzed in sin. He couldn't move forward. But in other cases, there may be other things that are keeping us from moving forward. But when Jesus gets involved and he sees our faith, it may be a miracle for somebody else. Jesus speaks to it directly. He sees the faith that we have because sometimes we're serving in faith. It takes faith to serve when you know that you have your own needs. It takes faith to serve when you're dealing with your own issues. But these men went out of their way to pursue their friend, to remove the obstacles and to lower him into the presence of Jesus. And Jesus saw their faith. And as a result, it helped that man to move forward. I believe that when we pursue people, when we remove the obstacles and we put them into the presence of Jesus, it helps them to move forward. That is what we're called to do. That is our purpose in reflecting the image of God in every environment that God has planted us to be in. I, I want to close with this thought because Jesus, after he has this exchange with the Pharisees, after he concludes this conversation, he tells the man to get up 
to pick up the mat and to go home. Go back out the same door that once was blocking your way. Move the people out the way. Go back to the environment where you once were paralyzed. Don't run from your testimony. In fact, take the thing that used to carry you, now you carry it and you tell the story of what God has done. And it all started with four friends recognizing if I can just get my friend into the presence of Jesus to remove the obstacles and to use faith with presenting him in the presence of Jesus, it's going to help this man move forward. I believe that whenever we get connected and serve in community, it gives us an opportunity to pursue people, to remove obstacles, and to ultimately help people to move forward. That is what God is inviting us to do. The statement that is made is, we have never seen anything like this before. I truly believe if you want to see something you've never seen, you have to do something you've never done. What is it that God is compelling you to do right now? Maybe there's a gap right now in what you're seeing or what you are experiencing but I believe that we have to pursue it. Our pursuit determines our experience. I believe that God is challenging some of us right now that it's time for us to get off the sidelines. It's time for us to get involved. The same way that I was sitting back and just kind of waiting to experience my purpose and calling, it wasn't until I said yes that I actually began to walk in it and seen that step after step, yes after yes, it ultimately led me to walking in what I know that I'm ultimately called to do with reflecting God's image in the community that he has planted me to be in. I believe that same thing is available for some of us right now. But what I recognize there may be some in our community that you may feel like that paralyzed man, that man who cannot move forward because maybe you haven't reconciled or made yourself right with Jesus yet. I wanna let you know that's available. So if that's you and you're in our community, you know that your next step is simply to commit your life to Jesus. We're going to create space for that right now. We want to make sure that you recognize and understand that Jesus came, that he didn't come to be served, but he came to serve you, to give his life as a ransom for you and allow you to be a part of this community of faith that he died for and that he was raised for. So if you know your next step is simply to say yes to Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer with me. I want you to do it out loud. I want you to do it in your heart, but speak it out loud because the Bible speaks about the power of confession. I want to lead us in a prayer. Repeat this after me. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. I believe that you died on the cross and that you rose from the dead. And your word says that my belief, my faith in that will now allow me to walk in salvation. So please fill me with your spirit and order my steps. In Jesus name, if you pray that prayer and you believe it in your heart, we truly do believe that you have transitioned, that you that you're on this journey now. Please make sure you let us know, because we would love to come alongside to serve you and give you the resources that you need. But what I also want for the rest of us, I want us to diligently pray about what is it that God is telling you to pursue right now, because I recognize that our pursuit determines our experience and that we're all called. We all have a purpose of reflecting the image of God and it unlocks it when we serve one another. What is it that God wants you to serve in? What community does God want you to be a part of? Maybe it's not as time for you to get off the sidelines, but to actually get involved and participate in advancing the kingdom. Let me pray for us. Lord, I thank you for our community. I thank you for what you've commissioned us to do and how your love pursues us. So now we're able to pursue you and pursue others on your behalf. I pray right now for everyone in our community that is wrestling with their purpose and calling what their next steps look like, that you begin to reveal to them that their next step is to simply say yes to the environments that you're telling them to serve in, to get involved in. And with them saying, yes to that. They will find fulfillment and peace as they reflect your image in the community that you've called them to be planted in. So Father, I pray for strength. I pray for stability. And I pray for anyone that is paralyzed in anything that they're struggling with, God, that you bring healing, deliverance, and breakthrough. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, church. I love you. I'm so thankful for you. And I cannot wait to see what next steps you take with making sure that you pursue what God has for you. Can't wait to worship with you next week. Celebration Church DC, it's been such an honor to be with you today. Uh, make sure that you download the Celebration Church DC app on the Google Play Store or on the App Store. That way you can stay up to date with everything that's going on in the life of our church. We love you guys and we'll see you for church at home next Sunday.